Hey, what's going on, CY? This is Pastor Chris. And well, we had a little bit of a snafu with our tech last night in CY service. So normally we would record that message and get it out to you guys, but it wasn't recorded. So I am re-recording it today to make sure that you get to learn about this amazing thing called Romans Road. Now, Romans Road is actually not a road in Rome at all, really. So what is it? Well, Romans Road is a series of Bible verses found in the book of Romans that show us a road to salvation. This includes Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 5.8, Romans 10.9, Romans 12.1-2, and Romans 8.38-39. through 39. So we're going to be studying Romans Road, and we're going to do it in a very, very special way. Now, normally in CY, you would hear what is called topical sermons, where we decide a topic, whether it be like, you know, anxiety, depression, and then we would take all of the scriptures found in the Bible about that topic and write a sermon based on those things. This series is going to be a little bit different. Uh, we will focus on the text and structure the sermon around the content of that specific Bible verse. This is called expository preaching. And this will be our structure. We will talk about contextual understanding. So we're going to study the historical, cultural, and literary context of the verse. I'm going to give you a, a systematic explanation. So I'm going to provide insight into the meaning of specific words, phrases, and concepts. And yes, even getting words down to the Greek. I will also provide some doctrinal integrity. So I'm going to connect these Bible these Bible verses to other biblical truths, doctrines, and themes that are found throughout the Bible. And then lastly, I'm going to show you an application to life. And I'm going to include practical applications to the lives of the listeners, aka you guys. So why are we studying Romans Road? Well, y'all, I want you to be able to effectively um, communicate the gospel to your friends. Believe it or not, as, as your youth pastor, it is not my responsibility to explain the gospel, to explain Jesus to your friends. But it is my responsibility to teach you how to study and how to preach the gospel. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I love Mexican food, all right? I love me some burritos. Anybody love burritos? Okay, awesome. I recently had the best steak burrito I've ever had in my entire life. If you're in Goshen, I encourage you to check out Angelita's in Mexican Kitchen. They have a wonderful steak burrito. And I remember, like, as I'm eating this burrito, all I wanted to do was tell my friends about it. I wanted to tell all of the pastoral staff, guys, you got to check out this burrito. I, I couldn't wait to tell Pastor Kenny because me and Pastor Kenny – we like to eat, okay? When we experience something incredible, we want our friends to experience it too. And if that's the way we feel about good food, about music, or that new show that we just discovered, how much more desperate should we be to share the redemption power of Jesus Christ? Well, Romans Road teaches us how to do this with scripture. Before we move on, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I just thank you so much for every single student over at a Newburgh campus. God, our students in Duchess, God, and, and, and anyone else who is watching this on YouTube, Father, God, I pray that uh, this lesson would, would, would bless them, would teach them more about your word. And God, I pray that we would not keep the gospel a secret, but God, I pray that every single student would be able to tell their friends about Jesus and do it in a way that's kind of mapped out for us in Romans, Father. We love you. We need you. Everyone said amen? Amen. All right, so let's break down this first scripture in Romans Road. Romans 3.23, it says this, For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God, 
All right, so going back to our structure first, let me provide some contextual understanding. Now, this passage of Scripture was written 20 to 25 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Many of the disciples and many of the people who saw the resurrected Jesus are still alive, and they are preaching the good news. They are preaching the gospel. Well, at this time, persecution is rampant. And Christians are being killed, not only by the Romans, but also by, by the Jewish people. So this brings us to our author. Now, I know some of you are Bible scholars already. So do me a favor and somebody shout, who wrote the book of Romans? Of course, JC knew. Okay. Um, well, Paul is the author of the book of Romans. But Paul had a different name in the beginning. In fact, he was Paul, but he was actually a guy who was formerly known as Saul. So Saul was born into a Jewish family in the city of Tarsus, which is now in modern-day Turkey. And he was a Roman citizen by birth. And by being a Roman citizen, he had all the rights and privileges as a regular Roman citizen. But on top of that, he was raised in a devout, a devout Jewish environment and received a thorough education in Jewish law and traditions. In fact, Paul, or formerly known as Saul, uh, he becomes a Pharisee. And many of you guys can remember the Pharisees. These are the guys who are most responsible for plotting and eventually killing Jesus. So as a Pharisee, Paul, formerly known as Saul, well, he would actually be part of the persecution of Christians, and he would seek out Christians to kill and to murder. In fact, he was present uh, during the stoning of Stephen, who was one of the first Christian martyrs in Acts chapter 7 and 8. But Saul ends up converting to Christianity after an encounter with the risen Christ in Acts chapter 9. I encourage you, read that. It's an amazing story. And his name was changed. And Saul became Apostle Paul, who is one of the most influential figures in Christianity. So that's the author. But then you have to really ask yourself, okay, why did Paul write this book? And he did it because of two reasons. One, racial tension and theological divide. See, at this time, different people groups were really rising up against each other. First, you had the Gentiles, which were the people who believed in Jesus but had no Jewish ancestry. They weren't Jewish. They were Jewish people. Then you had the Messianic Jews those who were Jewish, but then who did believe in Jesus and that he did die and that he was raised from the grave. And then you had just the regular Jews who didn't believe in Jesus at all. And you see, Paul wanted to help everyone understand the unbelief of the Jews, God's continual work with Israel, the Jewish roots of the gospel, and the full inclusion of Gentiles as children of Abraham. And one of the biggest things, and this is going to be, it's going to sound so small, but it's so significant in, in helping you understand the book of Romans. You see, Paul decided to write the book of Romans in a specific language. He decided to write it in Koine Greek. All right, so let me give you a systematic explanation here then. So Paul could have written the book of Romans in Hebrew. After all, he was raised a Jew. But instead, he chooses to write the book in Koine Greek. This is very important, y'all. Because at that time, the Jewish people, they knew two languages. They learned Hebrew and then they also learned Koine Greek, which was the language of the Roman Empire at the time. So the Gentiles, they didn't understand Hebrew, but they understood Koine Greek. 
So Paul used the language that was used by the widest group of people at that time. In fact, Koine Greek was the official language of science and scholarly study at that time. And understanding why Paul wrote this book and how he did it in Koine Greek gives us a deeper insight on this verse, Romans 3.23. Again, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of of God in the original Quinny Greek, Hapantes Gar Amorton Kai Historante Testoxis Tau Teo. Um, which by the way, if you're watching this sermon in Greece, um, I'm sorry, I gave it the best shot. But as we look into this verse, you have to understand why Paul wrote it. Remember the racial divide, the racial tension. The word all that Paul uses comes from the Greek word hapantes. And Paul is saying this, everyone, Jew and Gentile, needs Jesus. It doesn't matter if you're Ethiopian, doesn't matter if you're Roman, doesn't matter if you're Egyptian, all hapantes, you need Jesus. Doesn't matter if you're Black, Hispanic, Caucasian, you need Jesus. It doesn't matter if you are poor, if you are rich, you need Jesus. It doesn't matter if you are popular or not popular. It doesn't matter if you are Muslim, Hindu, or agnostic. You need Jesus. All people, hapantes. This is important, y'all, because Paul is basically saying Jesus is not only the Jewish Messiah, he is everyone's Messiah. Jesus is for all. Why is that? Well, going back into the Koine Greek, Paul uses the word test or the phrase test doxis, which is what we translate as glory. So all have, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But test doxis, this is a phrase used to describe God's perfection. So what Paul is really saying is all have sinned, okay? All of us have fallen short of perfection. I love the way Pastor Jared puts it. Um, none of us are 10 for 10 on the 10 commandments. And if you break one commandment, you break them all. None of us are 10 for 10. All of us are zero for 10. So all of us have fallen short of perfection. But the good news is that Jesus is for all. Let me provide some doctrinal integrity. And we don't have to go far. Romans 3.22. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. 1 John 2.2. 2. He is the propitiation of for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. John three seventeen. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So now we see that our interpretation, that Jesus is for all, and all of us have fallen short of God's perfection, we see that our interpretation now is backed up with other scriptures. Okay, so now let's talk about the application to life. What does this mean? After we broke this verse down, after we got it to the Greek, how do we apply this to everyday life? Well, one is this. Racism and discrimination have no place in the authentic Christian walk. No place. And unfortunately, we see on the news a lot of racial tension, especially in regards to the Jewish people. But racism and discrimination have no place in the authentic walk, the authentic Christian walk. Two, no matter how you feel about somebody, Christ died for them. And Jesus seeks a relationship with them regardless of how you feel about that person. And lastly, and this is important, Jesus is the only way to God. 
Jesus is the only way to heaven. Why do I say that? It's because of this. If Jesus is for everyone, then he is the only one for everyone. So that's Romans 3.23. Let's break down Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life and Christ Jesus our Lord. So again, contextual understanding. Okay, who's the author? Paul, we already talked about that. We now know that he wrote the book of Romans because of racial tension, but also because of theological divide. Was Jesus really the Savior for all? Was Jesus just the Savior of the Jewish people? Do the Gentiles get to be accepted as children of God? You can't separate the redeeming power of Jesus from the story of the Jewish people. You, you just can't. Because it was the Jews who had been promised a Messiah. And they waited thousands of years to see him. And it is through Jewish theology and doctrine where we find the answer to why Jesus had to die. Have you ever thought of that? Like, why did Jesus have to die? Why couldn't God just I don't know, sprinkle some glitter on people and be like, okay, boom, you're good. Now you can enter into heaven. Why did God have to do it this way? Well, let's go back to Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let's get it down to the Greek. He, Paul uses this word wages. The wages of sin is death. Wages comes from the Greek word misthus, and it basically it is a word that, that means um, what someone deserves. So Paul, he's really saying this, is because of sin, we deserve death. Because of sin, death is the natural consequence. I love what Pastor Mike Evans says, too. God doesn't necessarily send people to hell. Hell is our default destination. Why? Because of sin. Let's look back to the Garden of Eden here. Because death was not originally part of God's framework. Death wasn't supposed to be part of the Garden. And Adam and Eve, they were warned. There was a tree, and God warned them and said, Eat of the tree, and you will surely what? You will surely die. So they ate of the fruit, and they were ashamed, and they hid from God. God reached out to them and talked to him, talked to them, and then God made them a covering out of animal skin. Now, what has to happen to an animal before you skin it? That animal has to die. That is where death is first introduced in God's creation. Then Adam and Eve were removed from the provision of the garden, and then they had to work the field. So now they actually have to work and toil and soil and all of that. And then they were also removed from relationship with God. So really, we see three different deaths in Genesis. A physical death, human mortality and suffering. A spiritual death, a spiritually cut off and a source of life and goodness, that is God. Um, and then eternal death, which is sin leads to forever separation from him. This is everything that God had to address. Yes, God's first solution was to take a life of an animal, but this was an imperfect solution. Why? Because animal does not equal man. This also did not make sense economically because a rich person would have many animals to sacrifice, whereas a poor person wouldn't. So it also prevented God from being able to show his love to all. Hapontes, he couldn't, he couldn't show his love to all people for all eternity. So for every sin of every man and woman to be covered, a better substitute was needed. So he promised a savior. He promised a Messiah. So why couldn't God accept people's sin into his presence. Why was there a separation? Well, it's because of this. God is holy, 
holy, holy. And anything that is done that is that does not meet his standard is inconsistent with his holiness. You know, last month we talked about the tabernacle and we talked about Levitical law and how the Israelites worship God. I also talked about how, how God laid out a plan for the priest to cleanse himself to make sure the priest was perfect before he entered the Holy of Holies, before he entered God's presence. Now, this part isn't found in the Bible, but this is part of the Jewish oral tradition here. So what they would do is they would actually tie a rope on the ankle of the priest. Why? It's because if the priest didn't do everything right, if the priest was not perfect in the eyes of God, the priest would drop dead in the presence of God because of his holiness. And so no one had a and so to make it to where no one had to go in and get the body, they would simply uh, pull the dead body of the priest out who had died. So this is the reason why Jewish history is so important for us to study. It's because it explains why Jesus had to die and why Jesus was the Messiah. Do you know why Jesus is called the pure spotless lamb? It's because of the Old Testament. It's because of Jewish history. So back in Exodus, before the 10th plague of Egypt came, God instructed Moses to tell the Jewish people to mark the doors of their house. And they were to slaughter a pure spotless lamb and take its blood and sprinkle it on the top and sides of the wooden doorpost, the front door, to their homes. So when the angel of death came to kill the, all the firstborn in Egypt, the angel of death would come to a Jewish household, and he would see the blood, the marking of the wooden doorpost, and he would pass over them. Why? Because in that house was God's people. And because of that blood, they were covered. Because of that blood, death would pass over them. And just as the Israelites, they slaughtered the lamb, and, and it was the blood on the wooden doorpost that indicated death to pass over that household, so does Jesus' blood. Only instead of wooden doorposts, his blood is found on a wooden cross. And it is because of his death that death passes over over us. That eternal separation can pass over. So God provided the covering from Adam and Eve. God provided the covering for the Jewish people in Egypt, a pure and spotless lamb. And God provided a covering for our sin, another pure and spotless lamb. And his name is Jesus. Let me give you some doctrinal integrity. And all we have to do is study Jesus' words. John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus is saying this. Hey, you are separated from God, but I'm here to change that. Your sin separates you. But I want to take on that sin and take it to the cross and remove that. I am the lamb. I am the guy. If you want God, Jesus is saying this, believe in me. Okay, so we broke down that scripture. So what is, what is its application to life? Well, one, I want to encourage you with this. This is a big one. Stop ignoring the Old Testament. See, the Old Testament is not just the Jewish Bible, the Hebrew Bible. It's also part of our Bible. And when you study the Old Testament, you can better understand the, the, the things that happened in the New Testament. And lastly, it's this. Accepting the gift of Jesus is the only way to beat the wages of sin. To beat those wages, mythos. To beat what we deserve because of sin. 
It is because of, of the gift of Jesus that we can beat physical death, spiritual death, and eternal death, that eternal separation from God. Like I said in the beginning, y'all, when we experience something incredible, we want our friends to experience too. So I want to encourage you with this. If you have not placed your, uh, your faith in Jesus Christ, I want you to talk to one of our CY leaders during small group, and maybe afterwards they can guide you in a prayer of salvation to help you start that relationship with Jesus. And lastly, for the rest of you, you guys should have gotten a little bookmark, okay, at your campus, and I want everyone to have this bookmark, and I want to challenge you to memorize Romans Road. Why? Because I know that someday God is going to call you to explain the gospel, to explain everything to a friend who, who doesn't know Jesus. Romans Road will help you explain the redemption power of Jesus. We're going to do more next week, so stay tuned, y'all. Be there next week. I love y'all. I hope you are blessed by this message. And I'm, let me pray for you. Father, thank you for these amazing students. God, I pray for amazing conversations to happen during small groups, Father. And God, I pray for a mighty anointing over each student, God. God, as they step onto their, their schools or their workforce, Father. God, I pray that they would be missionaries for the gospel. We love you. We need you. And everyone say amen. Amen. God bless y'all.